And Charles and Ramesh, you are now going to take us through some of the key points that, uh, the, some of the ideas, some of the things that came out of the masterclass this afternoon. So, the stage is yours. Thank you, Heather. Um, great to be back on the stage. We had a very productive session earlier, and welcome to the people in the room that weren't here earlier. Um, so, I'm Charles Perry. I was chairing this morning. I have an, my, a business called Second Nature, which I've recently sold, and we're all about sustainability. And one of the things that I've found out today, which I really wasn't aware of, is that the Water and Food Awards is all through volunteering. And that really is quite a profound thing when you think about it. So people have come here to help put today together, and many of them have funded their own costs. And this is extraordinary when you think of how much work has gone into today. The team that comes from all over, and includes some fascinating, very busy people who've given up of their time to be here to pull this together. And I'm gonna do something slightly unusual because I've noticed that we are very fortunate to have the business secretary, Vince Cable, Ayrton's gra grandfather, in the back of the room. Welcome. <laughs> and talking about extremely busy people who've given of their time to be here, it's, it's really wonderful. I mean, of course, you've come to see your son and your grandson in action, but no doubt you know quite a bit about what's going on here, Vince, um, and it's great that you've taken your time out of your busy schedule to be here. And I think it's important um, you know, that we're all aware, whether we come from business like myself, or government like the business secretary, or NGOs, the third sector, of what's going on today. I mean, L Tina and Ayrton were on Sky News this morning with Eamon Holmes, and all of this is through volunteerism. They are being the change that we were talking about earlier. I think we should give them a round of applause. You ready, sir? Are we ready? I, I believe so. Uh, we're going to share this microphone. Yeah, I think we're going to be a bit of a tag team. Okay, so Ram. Jump off the top rope. Do you want to first introduce yourself, Ramesh? Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Ramesh Kent. I represent an organization called the Permaculture Research Institute, which is actually based in Australia, but uh, we have branches uh, located around the globe. Uh, we uh, are primarily uh, an educational nonprofit, uh, but we also set up demonstration sites, um, demonstrating a lot of the ideas that you find within uh, permaculture design, which is uh, it's a design science that's um, primarily um, concerned with the manner in which uh, natural systems are, are, are pieced together. Uh, and a lot of what we try to do within the, sci the design science is to, is to really mimic the successful um, uh, and effective uh, patterns that you find in nature, the, the functional patterns that you find in nature. And we often use this to address many of the problems you find in regions where you see a great deal of land degradation, uh, desertification. Uh, we do a lot of work in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, the Gulf, um, uh, Central Asia, uh, I just came from Somaliland, so we work in uh, the Horn of Africa as well. And I think you'll find that there are often uh, a number of very uh, common features that you see within those landscapes um, which can be effectively addressed by utilizing a science like permaculture. And I think um, when you are able to effectively address those problems using a, a knowledge-based approach, many of the things that we, we find ourselves see, uh, see, seeing in the world that we don't like um, as it concerns uh, uh, things related to security or politics or the like, we know that they're very intimately connected to problems related to landscape. And so this is one of the things that we try to apply within, within this particular region so we can begin to address those problems in a, in a much more meaningful manner. So as, as harvesters, some of the things that we heard as we roved around the room, I mean, I'm just going to throw in, I was sitting at a table with lots of young people, and they were talking about, well, you know, can we make this more fun? Sustainability is a long word. How do we make it more fun and engaging, and how do we uh, engage the youth without talking in very intellectual terms or sophisticated terms or using lots of difficult words? How do we just make this simple and fun and engaging for young people? 
Um, about three, three and a half, almost four years ago, uh, John Liu and I met in Switzerland um, at an event called the Co-Forum uh, for Human Security. And I was very excited to meet John because I became familiar with his film, Hope in a Changing Climate, and it spoke to a great deal of what we were doing with our work. And the reason why I was so keen to meet him was because he works in media and he's concerned with creating narratives that are connected to this, to this work, to, to, to creating narratives, compelling narratives that are connected to concerns are related to, to water and food. And I think this speaks to what Charles was just mentioning about making this something that's engaging, making this something that's compelling. Um, we, human beings respond to, to, to great stories culturally, historically, that's, that's the way we've always worked. It doesn't matter where you go in the world. And I think one of the things that has come up from many of the discussions that we had during the masterclass was sort of thematically, we have to create stories that are connected to this particular activity that are compelling. It makes people want to get involved. It makes people want, want to care. It, it moves people to action. And when I say action, meaningful action, it's not enough to, to want to do well or, or to want to, to do good or to want to do better. Stop wanting to do good. Stop wanting to do better. Do good. Be better. Right? Get out there and do something instead of wanting to do it. And I think a lot of this is very much connected to creating narratives and so that it's compelling to young people. So it's compelling to, and, and it moves communities, right? It, it moves regions, it moves nations. And this is one of the things that I believe WAF is, is helping us to do is to create narratives of success and, and narratives that are engaging so that we can hopefully get more input which will enable the spread of the work. And indeed, And indeed, the whole theme of this week has been about action, you know, less talk and more action. And yesterday, many of us were in the House of Commons um, for the Pledge to Peace. And we were, um, we were hosted by Baroness Scotland and Hazel Blairs, and there was a, an extraordinary group of people in the Gladstone Room in the House of Commons. And we signed the Pledge to Peace. And the Pledge to Peace is just about doing one little thing today action. And of course, when we've been listening this morning to different uh, conversations, people have been saying, well, if we all continue on our own individual roads, trying to look after ourselves in our little silos, we're going to have conflict. But if we work together across cultures and religions and languages and take the trouble to understand each other, then we can start to develop solutions that are collaborative. And this reminds me just of the challenge of speaking in a language, and I, I'm, I'm not even sure I'm doing it right now, that everybody understands. We have people from all over the world in this room. We have people who speak all sorts of different languages. We've heard wonderful stories this morning. And the question is, are we really understanding each other? Are we listening to each other? And are we speaking in a language that we all understand without assuming that the other people that we're speaking to actually get the same meaning that we do? Because we all come from different experiences and perspectives. And only by harnessing those different experiences and perspectives are we gonna be able to provide a holistic solution to the challenges of sustainability. I think to continue with the theme of, of language and how critical language is in, in, in pushing a lot of these things forward, um, we were discussing on the side um, uh, a, a, a Joan Baez lyric that came to mind and, and I just happened to see this a couple of days ago in my Facebook feed. <laughs> um, and it was the lyric, um, action is the antidote to despair. Action is the antidote to despair. And I think one of the reasons why we see so many people despairing in the world is because they don't know what to do. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the training. They don't know how to, to, to piece, put the pieces together that will allow them to do things that will actually change the condition that they say they don't like. Right. So I think a, a great deal of what we're talking about here, and this is something that I, I believe is demonstrated in the projects um, that are eligible um, for the award this year, and it's certainly applied to what it is that we have been uh, doing at PRI, is that we're trying to enable people 
to be able to change the things that they say they don't like about what they see in the world. So a lot of this is about education, it's about knowledge transfer, it's about um, creating stakeholders, it's about trying to integrate different types of capital, and I think we have to remind each other that there are different kinds of capital. We've been, we're here in London, um, and this is the center of, um, of finance. This is a center of finance. I grew up in another center of finance. I, I grew up in New York, that's another center of finance. Um, but it's not the only type of capital that we, that we need to pay attention to. There's living capital, right? natural capital. There's experiential capital. Right? There is, um, there's, there's human capital. There's spiritual capital. Right? There are all of these different types of capital that we need to give value to, and we need to integrate them. And we have to value the differences because there are deficiencies in each of those different types of capital. There are deficiencies in each of the individuals that may be, become involved in an effort. And by combining our efforts, we cover each other's deficiencies. So we have to begin to put those things together so we can, we can create a more complete picture and address these, these issues. So just winding up, it's back to, you know, what is this big word sustainability that lots of people have been talking about today and our different pieces in the puzzle of how to solve the, the issues that we face around sustainability. And of course, um, you know, put simply, it's the ability to be sustainable. But I just want to take you back to a more purist definition, which is the original Brundtland, Gro Brundtland was the Prime Minister of Norway and she put together a commission that defined sustainable development in the late 1980s. And this was the definition, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So clearly it's about you know, using today's resources so efficiently that future generations are guaranteed that they will have survivability rather than using everything today as if there was no tomorrow. And this is a very topical point wherever you are around the world because, of course, we've just been through the Great Recession. So what have we learned from the Great Recession? We got into the Great Recession because of unsustainable practices. So hopefully coming out of the Great Recession, we're all going to be doing things more sustainably.